Should I turn off my video? Up to you. I think you two are going to be back on. I'm going to get you back in for questions at the end. But if you answer the chat questions and then hold everything until the end, you two can answer any question as well. After I'm done my spiel, right? Yep. Hello, everyone who is joining us. We'll give everybody a couple, a little bit of time to join us and come on in. Welcome to everybody. If you're joining us um, live or on Facebook, we're glad you're we're glad you're here. And I'll go ahead and get started. So, welcome to Preservation North Carolina Shelter Series. I'm Julianne Patterson, and I'm PNC's Outreach Manager. Our Shelter Series is virtual programming that allows us to connect with preservationists across the state on a variety of topics. Um, as you may have noticed, several of our programs this year, including this one today, um, focus on stories or themes that relate to a traveling exhibit that PNC debuted earlier this year called We Built This, that profiles Black architects and builders in North Carolina. The exhibit is currently at Historic Rosedale in Charlotte, we featured on the last Shelter Series, um, but it's traveling to the Bellamy Mansion Museum June 22nd, so next month. Um, and that is who we have here today. So you can find out more information about the exhibit and future events on our website, preservationnc.org. Um, the shelter series has always been free of charge and we hope to keep it that way, but I wanted to extend a huge thank you to everyone who added a donation to their registration today. It's greatly appreciated and helps us keep these programs going. Um, and especially as we're celebrating the end of preservation month. So thank you to everybody who's made a donation. Uh, because this is a webinar, we can't see or hear you, but we still want to answer your questions. So please ask questions at any time using the little Q&A box um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I'll moderate all questions at the end of the presentation. And if we don't get to your question today, um, I'll try my best to have somebody follow up with you directly. And if you have any technical issues at any time, please let me know in the chat box and I'll do my best to help. So today is part one of a two-part series looking at the role of slavery at the Bellamy Mansion in Wilmington, which is a stewardship property of PNC. We have Gareth joining us to talk about the restoration of the slave quarters today, and in two weeks, we'll take a deeper look at the lives and stories of some of the people who lived and worked there with Leslie. Um, so Gareth has been the executive director of the Bellamy Mansion since 2010, and he was at Historic Wilmington Foundation prior to that. He has an MA in history from UNCW and makes sure the museum fills its educational mission and remains a stable not-for-profit business. Leslie has been with the museum since 2015 and has served as operations manager since 2017. She has a master's degree in public history from UNCW. In addition to duties as operation manager, she acts as the research historian and lead interpreter for the site. And I've also asked PNC President and CEO Myra Coward to join us for the Q&A portion because he's been with PNC since our relationship began with the Bellamy Mansion. So with that, I will turn it over to Gareth. All right, thanks very much. Welcome everybody. Um, it's nice to see a, a group on here with this interest. Um, if you haven't been to the Bellamy site, as Julianne was saying, it's owned by Preservation North Carolina which took over in the late 1980s with a restoration job. The idea being that this site is so important for social history and architectural history that it deserved to be kept and turned into a museum, which in our case opened in 1994. If you haven't been here, what we have on site are three buildings and some formal gardens. Uh, the buildings include the mansion, top right, which is a 10,000 square foot building finished in 1861, right before the Civil War started. We have a carriage house, which I'll get to in a minute. But the focus today, and for Leslie's talk in two weeks, is the slave quarters. Um, finished in 1859, the first building on site, likely finished. It is a very rare building in terms of its being interpreted, available to tour, and on a site like this, anywhere in the country. Uh, we've looked, and while these buildings weren't unusual to find in the period of slavery, um, they are unusual to find in this state and sort of as a teaching tool right now. So we're very fortunate to have this and be able to use it in the way that we do. It is, as you can probably see from this um, picture, 
the back stairs there, they're right next to each other, which is kind of important when you consider how urban slavery worked uh, and how the people who lived on this site interacted over time. My role today for this first of the two talks is really to talk about the building and less about the people. Leslie's going to get into the people next time and to tell you how it was built, um, why we thought it was, of course, vital to uh, restore it back to how it was in 1859. So that's kind of where I'm going with this. I'm gonna get into the minutia of how we restored it uh, in 2013 and 14. So now we go back a little from uh, these pictures in time to how this building appeared in the 1960s and 70s. As you can tell, um, they weren't in great shape. The last Bellamy who lived in the property died in the late 1940s. Um, it wasn't probably in great shape at that point, but then there were a raft of heirs that followed on after that. They could not necessarily decide what to do with the property. Over time, it was carved up, um, hard to paint, hard to maintain. Uh, parts of it were rented out over time for decades and decades. The building quietly declined, both buildings, all three buildings. Um, really. Actually, at the end of the 1940s, the carriage house was in such poor repair, it was bulldozed by the city. Fortunately, the slave quarters didn't suffer that same fate. Here's where we are now. Um, the back of the mansion itself, this is the view from the front door of the slave quarters. So you can see how close they are. And there's a psychological component to slavery that we talk about when we're giving uh, tours in terms of the fact that you are constantly being watched in the building that you're in. Um, and so this is how close you were to the owners, the Bellamy family, who owned uh, seven enslaved women in this building and two more men also on site at various points. So you get that proximity from this kind of image. And the quarters itself, uh, this is off the back porch of the house, of course. This is how it looked uh, throughout the 90s. And up until 2014, uh, when we finished the restoration and lime washed it in the original Italianate color. Um, I did want to bring up here the design of it because you can see it very well from this perspective. It is an Italianate building. Um, Italianate means it's harkening back to the 16th century Renaissance in Italy, of course. Um, it has features like an overhanging eaves, dental molding in the brickwork up top, curved top windows and items like that. One reason we think that it was architecturally um, so well built was one, the high skill of the people who built it. Um, they were enslaved, most of them, uh, high end artisan craftspeople. We'll put it that way. Some were enslaved and hired out from other houses around town and other owners in 1859. And some were free black um, workers as well. There was Wilmington being Wilmington and having a cosmopolitan and bustling port city vibe before the Civil War and after it actually, um, had a large number of highly skilled people there, which accentuated its building boom over time. So we have this property, Italianate in style, which mirrors the house. The house has also has neoclassical columns as well, but there's that. Um, there's something also on this, which I'll get into because I'm getting into the architecture. There's something called a coin, which I looked up, Q-U-O-I-N, also architectural feature of Italianate buildings, which is the corner brickwork. Just stands out. One of those features and one of those words that I'd never heard of until we were researching into this building. How it's set up, about 1,300 square feet, two floors, um, two privies on the east end of the building, uh, a laundry room, we could keep it sort of a utility room in the center, the room on the west, which we think that the enslaved uh, cook housekeeper, whose name was Sarah, probably lived in. Then we have the upstairs rooms, three rooms where people slept. Uh, bedrooms is a word we don't really use because that word describes comfort. Um, this was a utilitarian building in many ways, as so many of them were in the south and in the north uh, where slaves lived. This one just happens to be extremely well built and has lasted, and as we said, there's an element which I'll get into about how you interpret a space like this when it is an excellently built building because of the skills of the people who built it. Here we are looking at it over time. Um, you could probably pick the top two as being the 1950s into the 1970s, something like that. The back of the property was, of course, 
neglected. Um, there aren't particularly historic photos of this. Usually any photos taken of the, of the property, the site, are of the big grand house at the front, of course, the slave owner's house where they were proud of that level of architecture, the more utility buildings in the back, not so much. But in the 80s, um, or late 80s and into the 90s and beyond, um, the bottom left-hand corner is where we kind of see some of the work done by Preservation North Carolina in shoring it up. Um, some of the board members at the time put a new roof on, the windows of course replaced and the doors. The pile of brick you can just make out at the left is the remnants more or less of the carriage house that had fallen down. And bottom right is more or less where we are today. Um, restored, one of the reasons an Italianate style again uh, is that it's painted pink or that tan color as rosy tan, I believe it was referred to as, is the fact that that would have been the style at the time. There was paint research done, which found that that was what was on it. But it's not um, paint, it's actually lime wash. Lime wash is um, a composite, it's water, slate kind of um, ground limestone essentially, so lime and a pigment. The pigment in this case being that color. What that does, it allows the brick to breathe. Um, paint encapsulates water usually, and you might want to keep the water out, but for brick, you want brick usually to breathe a little bit, particularly this incredibly porous brick, which we'll talk about in a bit on this building. So lime washing was the protection, but also allowed it enough where, unlike say a latex paint, which completely seals the surface, it doesn't do it like that. This is something slightly different. This shot I put in um, so you could see what was where the carriage house, which was a very similar looking building, we think, because there aren't any photos, uh, to the um, slave quarters, which is off in the background there. The current version of that is our visitor center, and it's actually on the um, same footprint. Uh, and we, it was trying to be styled in the same brick style and all that as well. So when PNC took over, this building had been gone since the late 1940s um, into the late 1980s and was actually not rebuilt or a new version of it rebuilt until 2001. The stages of the, of the whole project as you were um, is to restore um, the mansion itself, then fundraise and build this building so we could have a visitor center and then restore the slave quarters back to how it was. Since the very beginning of the tours though, in the 1990s, uh, Slave Quarters was on tour. Um, it's an integral part of the interpretation then, and it really is the centerpiece of where we begin all our tours now. So what was the research like? Um, this was before my time, but I know it was exhaustive. Uh, a man named Peter Sandbeck worked at the State Historic Preservation Office. The number of people at Archives and History in Raleigh and PNC staff and many others did a lot of research in the top left, Peter produced a book, about four volumes actually, on what this building was all about and how to fix it, how to put it back. Um, that was exceptionally handy when we came to do this work in, in, the mid, in 2013. It was full of photos, of course. It was full of materials. It was full of paint samples. It was full of everything that you could possibly need if you get into the preservationist sort of nerd zone what co chemical composition was the plaster made out of, all that kind of thing. You can see here from some of these pictures what a state the building was in. Um, Leslie had figured out that the last person to rent it was in the 1930s, but the last person who was um, a former slave lived in it in the 1870s. So it was kind of rented out, kept the storage, but there was never any um, like, like running water in this. There was never any power to this building. So it kind of was a, a second secondary thought to everything else. So really over time, and particularly after 1930, it simply deteriorated at the back of the property. That's the situation when in the mid, in the 80s and 90s, when this research was done. It's a privy, you go down into a privy pit and what are effectively the toilet area uh, at the end of the building. Um, all that was even dug into literally in an archeological fashion. Um, you can see here that the ceilings are missing. Um, a lot of the plaster work had fallen away, but there's some really cool details. Um, it's one of which like graffiti on the wall over time. And we found some of that on the backs of doors as well. And we'll get into a brick in a minute where that's kind of a little 
just details where people have touched the building, been involved in the building over all these years and have left a mark on it, you know, um, which I find just fascinating when you get in, into all this. And again, because we value this building so highly for what it is, we really do keep a record of all these um, details, all these fixtures and things like that that are in there so that there will be a linear history of what it was and where it was and, and why this is so valuable to keep. An archaeological dig, again, around the same time, <clears throat> um, the staff at the time in that um, newsletter article up top there, were talking about how they had spent many years, several years, digging through various sections of the site. That included the privy pit. Now, a privy pit where people use the bathroom um, usually turns out to be a really good trove of uh, artifacts, pieces of bone, trash that people threw away, or things that fell out of their pockets, all sorts of odds and ends. So for an exhibit piece that we have from our archive or collection, I should say, a toothbrush, top left there, um, old pieces of pottery, garden implements, buttons, the end of a pipe, just bits and pieces that you find all over a site like this, which just inform you that it's kind of a, a lived space, you know? <clears throat> One of the things about preservation is it's not about the buildings in, whole terms you know it's about the story of the people who lived it who built the buildings who lived in them that's the crux of the thing and the buildings help us tell that story and so do the archaeological findings that we made <clears throat> talking of which and you have to excuse me i had my brush with covid recently so my throat might i might cough a little um I'm not going to talk, as I said, about the people as much as I'm going to get into the weeds of, of the building and the interior parts of that. But I do want to not, I don't want to not mention them because some of the stories and the ones that Leslie's going to tell at this lecture in two weeks are just fascinating. And the people who built this, I, I can't emphasize enough how highly skilled and kind of brilliant some of these people are and their stories were. Um, the Howe family, Alvin Artis, who was one of the lead contractors on there, the two white northern architects who John Bellamy hired to actually build the site, but one of the lead contractors, the Sadjwa family, a long history in Wilmington in politics and in much else, and then Gould and Taylor, who I'll talk about in a second. There are people who become state representatives amongst these um, contractors and craftspeople, and they do such an incredible job of this, but this is just one little piece of a much broader history that we're able to tell by keeping this building intact and go through it. you know, um, There's an exhibit that Leslie designed some years ago talking about urban slavery, where we delve into some of the lives of those people. And, and that's one part of the lecture next time. But I don't wanna you know, not tell you that there are some incredible stories linked to the people uh, who built this building. Again, on this picture, you can see a bit more of the Oh, the brickwork above the windows and doors and things like that. Details that you might not expect to see on something which is a, a slave quarters. But because it was in proximity to the house and because the family was so wealthy and probably because, I mean, the house itself, the mansion itself is a statement of ego and wealth. It's like, look at what I can build with all the money that I've accrued because he had 115 enslaved workers to accrue it from, um, nine of whom were on this site. That may well be the statement of, of this building as well. However, there is a, a note to, on this. The back of the building has no windows. You are hemmed in and if you live in it and you are being watched all the time. You can't go onto the street in front of the house after curfew. Um, you have to have papers. And if you are black and enslaved uh, at this period, you are stuck in that building no matter how well built it is. So that's something to always keep in mind and that we emphasize on tours. Two of the people we talk about, having said that I'm not gonna talk about people, William Benjamin Gould, um, an enslaved plasterer who escapes in 1862. Um, another highly literate, highly skilled, brilliant person with an amazing story. One reason that we talk about him in detail uh, is because he kept a diary uh, of an escaped slave who signs up for the US Navy and fights back against the Confederacy, which we have and sell. So there's a whole story there. Some of the other research that we have all the information from are diaries like this. One diary by a guy named Rufus Bunnell, who was actually the draftsman architect on this project uh, with James F. Post, who was the lead architect. 
We also have Ellen Douglas Bellamy, one of the children, her diary. We have a diary of one of the sons of the family. So all this stuff, including all that archeological and all the research that was done is, makes this place kind of unique in the amount of information that we can glean from all these various sources uh, and that we then turn around and interpret. Henry Taylor, another story, and well, a hired out, enslaved but hired out carpenter on this site. His story, which I think Leslie's gonna get into next time, is the one that from five generations of being enslaved, his son is uh, the first black graduate from MIT as an architect. Another generation after that, the next guy's son, also from, well, the family's from Wilmington, um, designs public housing all over the country. And two more generations on, we were at Valerie Jarrett in the same family, uh, who was the, hired the Obamas in her law firm and then went on to work with them in the White House. So we have some, again, amazing stories and linear progressions through history to tell using this site. The untold stories as well, which we have on panels and exhibits around the site, are of the seven women. Three of them were children uh, who lived in this particular building. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about all that right now, but I do one of the points of having you know place-based learning and what we're doing here is to tell these untold stories right the story of the house or the building in the back of the property as opposed to the slave owning aristocratic landed gentry who also became white supremacists and ran for office and did all that in the big house well that's often very well told and very well documented in the back not so much so we are very usefully positioned to tell that story using this place, uh, you know, place-based learning that I'm talking about. So we, we know who was there, and we know some of it. We don't know all of it because um, a lot of the research where they came from, where they went, uh, is hard to find or not available anywhere, but we do know quite a bit. So the restoration, um, like I said, this has been on tour from 1994 onwards, <coughs> critical part of the tour as well. But when we came to restore it, we wanted to take it back from that damaged condition that it was in to what it would have been like, as close as you can get it, in 1859 when it was finished. We hired three contractors over time, Frank Castillo and CGC, Tommy Rogers Construction, and Wayne Thompson, who was a plasterer and brick mason, um, who's done a lot of work all over the East Coast. We're all involved in this. Um, we did, you know, went through how to fix it with the books that we had, plus use, using the resource of the State Historic Preservation Office as well, and the Secretary of the Interior Standards on how to fix things. They tell you how to fix windows, how to fix glass, how to fix plaster, and all of that. So that was kind of the way that we went about it, um, which proved to be a year-long process, but as it had been 15 years to get all the information together and then to raise what was about $400,000 in order to fix this, including a Save America's Treasures grant from the National Park Service. You can see how the progression for a small nonprofit to undertake something like this is quite huge. The idea being, we're gonna restore it as was. So this is the condition that you find it in. This is about 2012, somewhere in there. That had been worked on by PNC staff over the years and dabbled in by others over time. So it hadn't completely fallen down, anything like that. Um, and you were able to get upstairs and additions had been made. But in 2013, the big push uh, came. So here we are in the condition of the building that it was. One of the things I should mention from about 1930, when I said the last people lived in it, um, all the way through until this period we're talking about now, was that termites had their way with this building. Um, they got behind the plaster into the lath, which is what that wood material there is that holds up the plaster and just decimated it. If you get termites in a building like that where the interior structure is wood, well, they won't touch the brick exterior, but they'll leave the inside as a sort of hollow shell. So they would take out the joists and the beams and the ends of pieces of wood here and there, which means that after about 70 odd years of that, uh, it turns into dust. So that's what we found when parts of it fell down or <laughs> in the condition that it was in. For example, prior to this, the stairs went there. So you couldn't get upstairs for decades. Uh, that had to be a replaced, obviously, uh, which was something interesting because when you're in preservation, it's like, how do you bring it back? So those stairs that are back there are quite narrow, quite dark, quite steep. 
Um, those aren't ideal things. That's not how you do new construction. But when you're in preservation, you're kind of thinking, where's that line between bringing it back to as was and bringing it back to something a bit more modern? And in this case, because this building again is, is an artifact, like the house in front of it, this is an artifact. This is the point of a museum like this is to make sure that you treat it that way. So taking it back to how it was and leaving it in that condition it was a very deliberate choice um, that we made. I'm going to get into some details of how we got into it. <clears throat> it was like this. The lath is falling off the walls there. Um, the brick has a great deal of, of damage. When brick pops off, it's called spalling, usually. When the mortar fails, um, it's just weathered over time. These bricks are very soft as well, probably fired locally. And you can just see the damage. And when the lath comes, the plaster in front of it fails. Uh, the various levels of plaster, you have a brown coat underneath, a top coat and a finish coat on plaster. The finish coat being the really smooth, marbly looking one that you often see in historic buildings. But again, you just see it all quietly coming apart here. In this utility room, or laundry room, I should say, as downstairs is sort of the biggest, largest rooms front and center uh, on the ground floor. We got into some weeds, right, of this. So the plaster, and I learned all this stuff doing this. I didn't know this at all. The plaster is an aggregate of sort of lime, a certain gradation of sand and mixed in a certain way and then with horse hair. And these are the kinds of details that came from Peter's book and from the skills of the craftsmen who, and who built it in the first place and then restored it. You've got Spanish horse hair, not English horse hair. There's something about the horse hair, the coarseness, the length of it. I, I don't even know. But you have to use very specific things in order to get it back to where it was using the same kind of materials. And this is the level of preservation nerdiness that we got into with it, um, which was fascinating, absolutely fascinating to get into that. So for example, bottom left there um, on the ceiling is new plaster, exactly the same composition of plaster as the 1859 plaster put on by enslaved workers, which is on the walls right there. You come back with the flooring, what you can salvage. Um, as well and replay it, remill it and reuse it. In the bottom right, and I'll get to <coughs> why that's there, in this laundry room is essentially, because um, this was a point of labor down here, uh, is the, what will pass for a washing machine now, a heated um, basin for heating water and doing the laundry. This was a room that was used. Nothing in this, I can't say this enough, uh, this was a working space as well as a living space. The folks who lived in there, the seven women, again, three of them children, were domestic enslaved workers. Um, they did the laundry, the cooking, the cleaning, the fetching and carrying of chamber pots, um, the wood, the coal used to fire all the various fireplaces in the site and everything else. So all of that, and then a lot of it came through this space right here. So when we came back to interpret it, we wanted it to have the various pieces that were um, in the place at the time. There is actually some interesting behind the scenes part of this that that washing pot there vents <clears throat> cunningly behind and into the chimney section. It's all really well designed when you sort of take the building apart. You can see the bits behind what you can see on the surface. So there is a flue for that specifically that leads through the wall, goes up and higher into the chimney and joins where the rest of the fireplace would vent out. Things that you wouldn't think about necessarily if you didn't take the building apart like we had to do. <clears throat> Just outside that and down the end of the building are the privies, the, the toilets really. Two rooms back to back. Um, you can see the condition they were in in the 70s um, and 80s and now where we are now. But those two buildings down there, we think um, probably it was used racially divided uh, when the building was built before the Civil War, and quite possibly afterwards as well. But white men probably used the, uh, the one on the far end of the building, the right hand door that you see here. And then um, African Americans used the other um, privy. They are five by the five seats side by side, and I'll show you a picture of it right now. That's how they are, the sort of mirror image buildings, uh, buildings, rooms. Um, the one on the right was slightly better appointed. Um, some wallpaper at one point, a second window in there, for example, 
Um, and even as Peter noted in his book, um, they were carved differently. Uh, the, the shape of the toilet holes, for heaven's sake, was like better smooth, better worked, better finished. The hinges were better, things like that. So that's why we get our idea that white men probably would use that space more. But these, again, little details that you think about as you're going through to interpret everyday life, part of everyday life on a site like this. You can see the condition it was in on the left anyway previously and then finished after the restoration on the right. The privies itself. So another design feature, you see on the top left there, there are three chimneys on the building uh, in that parapet wall that's up there. Uh, the two on the left do um, what chimneys do. They vent fire, fires below on two floors. Oh, the middle one actually on the goes down to that uh, utility room I was talking about. The one on the right, which is what is referred to in here as the um, east chimney, has three flues in it, something you don't see again until you get into the, into the nuts and bolts of the building. Um, they vent, two of them, the privy pit under those privies uh, because you want that to vent clearly for safety and, of course, odour, but you don't want gases building up anywhere near a fireplace. So they vented that as well, um, all the way down the back of the building. So that's why there are three chimneys on top of this building when you wouldn't necessarily think that that was unnecessary. You could have done it with fewer than that. But the thought and the design that went into this building, um, I don't know, it's for its time quite advanced in terms of the way they were thinking on, on how to build this. And again, the skills it took to do the brick coursing to make that the thickness of the brick as you go down the building is also um, highly skilled. Bottom left, you've got the privy pit underneath those toilets, as it were. Um, not used since the 1930s, more than likely. So that was part of the archaeological dig. And when you get down in there, and I, you know, we occasionally take happy school groups down there and things like this, there is that archway in the brick. It sticks out in front of the building, not very far, as you can see, but in front of the building, basically under the doors as you walk into those privies, um, where those little steps are on the right there. What that is for is for digging out a privy when it gets full. Now this one probably never was, even though they emptied chamber pots from the major house in there and used it, and there's quite a few people on the site. What you did was you dug down a trench. Um, you dug down and then the contents, a, a trench in front, the contents of your privy would come out. And what I am usually say on tour is one of the least appealing historical jobs, right? They're called night soilers. You'd build a trench, the trench would fill, you would dig out the contents to the back of a wagon and presumably go and fling it in the river. But that emptying of, but again, an architectural feature, they thought it through. How are we gonna do this in years to come? How are we gonna empty these privies when they get full down the, down the road? That again, though, is one of the things which people who take the tour are just fascinated by, how the everyday worked on a site like this and how the design um, met that need. So that's what's down in the privy pit. If you ever come and take the tour and a special tour you'd have to take for that one. The brick restoration that we did, um, the brick is old. It is probably fired locally around town. There were brickyards uh, and other things um, at the time, pre-Civil War and brick merchants and things like that. Wilmington is basically a sand bank. So there's not a lot of clay about. So a lot of that probably was from further inland somewhere, or maybe even, yeah, probably further inland, not imported, but, but it's very soft. Brick is not, at the time, fired in gigantic industrial-sized factories, as it might be now. It's done uh, in smaller quantities. So that means that you end up with different temperatures on different days. You end up with different batches of material that you're using. So maybe more air gets in, maybe more water gets in, maybe you leave it longer to dry. So all sorts of different kinds of historic brick ex exist in that way. The one on the right here shows you new brick, much newer brick from when the carriage house was rebuilt. And then the left is the back wall of the slave uh, quarters itself. And you can see it pits, it spalls, and every, not every brick, but a lot of it is 
unique to its kind. Um, it wicks a lot of water because it's so spongy and filled with little tiny spaces inside uh, the brick itself. And all that's to do with the material and all the rest of it, all the environmental factors I mentioned, how hot it is and all that. So we had to deal with and think about all that as coming as we came back. The repointing, even the mortar. So <laughs> I was reading about this. Ours had a higher lime content, right? A higher sand, but mostly a higher lime. Unlike say a Portland cement, which hardens over time, because the brick is so soft, you don't want a Portland cement mortar in this because it'll harden and it'll bust the brick a lot faster. If the mortar is harder than the brick and the brick is quite soft, um, you'll pop the front over time, like 50 years down the road of the brick off. That happens elsewhere where patching has happened on the, on the piers around the, the mansion house itself. So you get that. So timing and the type of firing are, are just important ways of, of thinking about this. And this one got a um, sort of a beveled point on the mortar itself, uh, sort of a V. And that's to match what was already there. And, and that's in some ways a stylistic choice that people make when, they, when they're doing brick. Also some details that we found African and we found Afro and Afro-Caribbean um, kind of uh, traditions meant that you put things for luck in a, in a new building. And we found glass in amongst the, the mortar that was on there, pieces of pottery, pieces of bone, some of which are in our collection, like in the mortar, pushed in right at the end and finished or not, or not uh, covered over in, in that way for luck around doorways and things like that. Also, we found that the brick is so soft that it shows up fingerprints, like in the top right here. At some point when working with the brick, and here we have a different kind of mortar joint, but in the brick, you push it in uh, as you, it's that soft and it's that freshly fired perhaps, um, or when it was handled anyway, uh, it eroded that way from touch. So you can find a few of those points around the place too. We don't know if that was deliberately put there there's somebody like, you know, kids write their names in concrete or something like this. I doubt it, but we don't know quite why that's there. And if it was deliberately uh, done or part of the, this is a particularly um, ill-fired brick. This one too, I'm gonna refer to something here. We found one with writing on it. And I think Leslie's gonna get into that in her lecture far more, but Charlie Fremont <coughs> worked for the contractor, enslaved, that she found 14 years old, um, building, you know, maybe learning to be a bricklayer or something like that as an enslaved trade, uh, which of course is what built these properties at the time. Uh, again, we're thinking that it's quite possible, or Leslie is, that um, or we are, that probably uh, he's learning to read and, and write, become literate at this point, and perhaps practicing on a brick while he's there. I can't think of why he might sign his name on it, unless like with some of the graffiti, people are just putting their mark on the property. But there's a signature from an enslaved 14-year-old uh, uh, that we came across. Another one of those details that, that you find. Structurally, um, the building in these pictures, top left, that's called corbeling, right? And I, I wrote this down, <coughs> corbeling, you do a single brick course and it shouldn't project more outwards than half the height of the brick and mortar that you're using. So what that means is you're stepping it up and it's a European tradition, European architectural styles brought over um, that appeared and appeared amongst the enslaved population. And again, Wilmington had a lot of black contractors did a lot of building work here and were really well highly thought of. When you look back at the records in the newspapers, often it was black builders who built Wilmington and built the buildings in like the 1840s building boom. And they knew what they were doing. <clears throat> that corbeling adds strength to the fireplace, which is on the second floor. Now, the next picture, bottom left here, is that same fireplace looking down through the floor. Um, it held that chimney breast up and held that um, fireplace up. So you can see that that strengthening where you do end on end bricks and then side by side bricks and then you step them out, allow the building to like be stronger, hold together. It's usually though um, a piece which is more decorative and you see it on the outside of the building 
uh, but you don't see it for us. We've left some of it uncovered so you can see it in one of the in, underneath there. But you don't usually see that. So they did something which is usually decorative to add strength in this particular case. We also found in that bottom left uh, that you can see it up against the wall where the joists and things meet the wall. There's something called a mud sill, which is a projection of brick that sticks out about the width of one brick all the way around the top floor of that house, of that um, building. And the wood doesn't go into the brick. It rests on this mud sill, it goes like a lip all the way around. And what that means is that the brick structure isn't supporting the wooden interior framework. And the wooden interior framework isn't stabilizing necessarily the brick. They're nailed together, but they're not intersecting, like jetting into each other. So really you could take out all the wood on the interior that frames the upstairs and the staircase and everything else. And the, what would be basically a, a rectangle of brick would still stand fine or reverse it. You could take all the brick off and the framing, which is all heart pine originally. So it's like, con well, like steel good as some of it is fantastic material to use, um, would sit there too. And it doesn't necessarily need the brick around it. So another way that you see that one of the reasons these historic sites last is they're using really good materials and they really know what they're, what they're about, what they're doing in terms of, of making this. No shortcuts necessarily here. All right. Also, we found more things. Um, the joists where they meet, bottom left here. Even though I got a picture of handmade nails on here, they didn't use nails necessarily to do this structural members. So they would mortise and tenon, which is you take a smaller piece and push it through the larger piece. And that creates your joint. My, my, my dad was a joint, as a matter of fact, um, back in Wales. But you could tell me all about this. What they did here was you get a round wooden peg and you knock it through uh, the thinner piece. And then after you've pushed it through the larger joist, when you release that, they come apart a little bit and the wooden peg will bend and it'll never move again. It's a brilliant way of attaching two pieces together. And because they're using heart pine again, uh, they're not gonna move, they're not gonna rock and roll and sway uh, like you would get with something smaller. And you don't have to use what we'd use now, which is like a plate of metal, something like that. You wouldn't necessarily have to do that. The nails, of course, nail some of the last to the walls and are different sizes and shapes and are handmade. So you, you kind of, um, you're gonna get, a, a whole litany of things, but we find a lot of those where the various structural members and the doors and things like that are nailed together. Another thing that we took out or left wherever we could leave it, as much of this material as we could save and leave is pretty much what we did. Okay, so lath construction in this building. Um, lath is what holds the plaster on the wall. The wall, so you've got structural members behind it, um, lintels and beams and posts and things like that which frame the building is interior. Then you put these strips of wood across it called lath. Uh, we left some things called truth windows or just windows in the walls to show how it works. So you see the smaller one top right there <coughs> with the brick, and then you have, you're laying a piece down and then you're tacking on the lath across it. Bottom left shows what happens when you then press the undercoat, um, the first coat, brown coat as it's often called, of plaster on that. It squidges through the gap and forms a little curves over into something called a key. And then it hardens and you leave that and then you put your other coats on the, on the wall to make it into the shiny top coat finish wall that you do. The plaster that we use, like I said, again, we had to source it and find all the lime and things like that to make sure that we knew exactly what we were doing um, and it, that it would hold. You have to get it just right. So that it'll do that. And the word squidge comes up again through the gap and it turns over, but isn't too wet that it all falls apart or isn't too hard that it won't curve. Another thing, which is just a trade, which I couldn't do, but, and, but is, is a, an immense advantage to know what's going on in this building. We also took the wood out. We use, as I said, as much of the wood as we could we took it out, um, and even if we didn't put it back as floorboards because it was so termite eaten, as you see on the left, 
we put this stuff called Abitron, which is a modern technique. Um, it's wood hardener. It's a wood hardening system. It's chemicals that you put on, like, it, it looks a bit like, well, you see what it looks like. It looks a bit like um, a varnish, but it's not. It soaks in, it soaks in, it soaks in, and hardens the wood. And then you put another version on, which is like liquid wood on top of that. So for us, we got to reuse an awful lot of the wood that otherwise would have gone away, um, which would be unusable. And if we couldn't use it structurally, like floorboards, we would use it as baseboards, or we would use it somewhere else in the, in the you know, wherever we could in order to salvage as much as we possibly could. This bit I love, the window restoration in the weeds with this. The bending of wood, right? You can either, you can do it in several ways. The top right there is called a bird's mouth catch. And because these windows are not weighted, they hold the window up. So we, we make those still, while site manager Bob Locke still makes those because they're quite fragile and they break. But the bending of wood to make these Italianate arched window tops, you can either do something, um, it was called a kerf method, where you slit the wood ever so slightly, and then that allows you to bend it and glue it if it's thin enough. But we were thinking as we were going through this that instead of that sort of lamination of thin bits of wood bent in that fashion, some of the larger members on these really quite thick uh, wooden um, window frames were steam bent, which is another way of doing it. And we think we thought that at the time, I remember, because we're in a shipbuilding area. The state port is five blocks down the hill from Bellamy. And so you steam it, you steam this and wood and um, pine, pine is quite pliable. So you steam it in a receptacle big enough and then quietly bend it over time until you get the shape you want. And in that way, you can make these arched um, frames. So one of the two ways that you could probably approach that, we were thinking maybe steam done because at the time they probably weren't cutting it from a big enough piece to, to make this in this shape. That's kind of the, the conclusion that we sort of came to and the various bent strips of wood and laminations uh, that we found. Also, we came back, we hired a blacksmith and a whitesmith, somebody who works with different kinds of metals uh, to do the hardware on the shutters, for example, which is in the center there. And then we got into uh, the glass in there. About, because you saw all the pictures of it being somewhat destroyed, um, the wavy glass that you have in these, uh, basically, is, it happens like this. These are cylinder hand-blown glass, which was done right up until 1870, and then that's when it changed to something else. So you throw blown glass into a long cylinder after you heat it. Then you cut it and lay it flat. That's what leads to the lines and the bubbles. Uh, that appear in wavy glass, as we call it, in, in this particular instance. And as more machines did that over time after 1870, that was more industrialized, then you end up with the much clearer glass that you see now. So that's what we found out as and why we keep the wavy glass as much as humanly possible uh, on site where we can. So upstairs before and after, um, after all these processes that I've been talking about, you see the three windows uh, top left, match with the three windows down the bottom it's the same room the panoramic up top actually takes in the other room you can't do that anymore because there's a wall in the way um, but that's the state we got to and that's how much work was done same here the window is in the same place and um, we left some markings on the walls deliberately to show what the old plaster would look like it's the same wood just remilled and refinished it's the same fireplace it's the same you know as much as we could put back and even though a lot of the plaster in this room had fallen off the wall by termite damage, uh, we tried to bring it back to what it was. We even kept a blog uh, as we went along, um, a blog which talked about all this engineering stuff and all the, the brilliance of these people uh, and how they built it uh, through time as we did it. It still exists on the internet on our webpage. Then quickly, um, I'm gonna get into questions of interpretation. What do you do with this now that you have 1859 to try to bring it all the way back. What do we do? Um, some people interpret it as artistically. We have people who come through and I'm quite pleased to see that because the big house gets um, a lot of love in terms of because of the way that it looks. But because I think that this building, uh, the slave quarters personally is more important because of the, the story it tells than the big house. To me and Leslie as a historian, everybody else as historians think because of the story that it tells, 
it is more important than the big house. Those untold stories being told. The point of interpretation then is to get at the, what is life like in this period? Um, life is hot and cold, right? There's no, um, it's hot in the South, shockingly to you all. There is no air conditioning. There is no electricity in this building. There is no running water in this building. There's a well outside. So it's gonna be hot. It's gonna be uncomfortable. Um, they are working dawn to dusk, except for some time on Sundays. Um, it, these women are domestic enslaved workers. And some people ask us when they come in, they say, well, was it so bad? This building looks like a nice building. And we think, all right, I understand the question and where you're coming from, but it's like the, the oxymoron of a good slave owner. You've got to think that one through considerably. If you look at the windows of the top two right pictures there, you see the house. You see the people who own you, the people who control you. And for all 4 million and plus enslaved people over 200, 300 years, the underpinning of violence is always there. That's what held that institution together. And whereas this is a solidly built building, you've got to think about that, about these people were owned by other people, they had no freedom. They had access to better food, a state port, a medical doctor, and they lived in this property. That does not negate the gigantic caveat that they were enslaved and trapped right here. So this is how we interpret it right now. Um, we tell that story through exhibits and the way we lay the building out in terms of sparse furniture and pallet beds. We tell that story to fifth graders. Um, <laughs> we open the building on our family day. We make sure that we interpret it um, for everyone to make sure that, again, the people can learn from place-based learning of being on the site. Kids in particular, I love to see uh, school groups come in through this so we can tell them the history that I'm telling you and the people that Leslie's gonna tell you about next time. We even have an interpretive event. We don't do many. I try not to do too many in the building. I, I think the building is special in, in a way that I don't wanna use it for anything by any means at all. Um, but this one was uh, Joe McGill, bottom left-hand corner. He's sitting in the purple shirt and black jacket at the top. Uh, he sleeps in slave quarters to bring attention to them. I'm sure he's pushing 200 all over the country that he's done now. And a group, including Leslie, who's our ops manager now um, and site historian next time, is in that group of grad students staying the night in there. And she can tell you what that experience was like to stay in that building and experience it and try and get a feel for what that history is like when you're in it. Same um, for the capstone project in the top right hand corner, interpreting, interpreting the building. Um, same again for the fifth grade tours, or those are smaller kids, I think, uh, in the bottom right. We also have two events that we did specifically for commemoration of the building itself and particularly the people who lived and worked on it. Um, they're called The Gathering. We did two of them, one in 2013, one in 19. We made sure we had um, choirs representing local black churches there. Uh, we had people come up from Savannah to sing as well. We, invite, we wanted to make this a community event, a community hub, a community place to be and remember. This was in about, uh, just as we were getting about halfway through the restoration that year. Um, yeah, we had a keynote speaker from UNCW, uh, John Haley, who's an old professor of mine, who uh, was just brilliant on what a sense of place when you're between these two buildings in this space, what that means. We, not repeated, but um, did a similar event in 2019 uh, in order to showcase all the things that we found out about the people who lived there in the intervening time. Uh, another gathering, um, another opportunity to have the community come and see this building and experience what it is and, and learn what we've learned over time. Uh, in this one, we had a quilt exhibit, African-American traditional quilt exhibit in the, in the main house, and then tours of, of the slave quarters itself. Choirs again, and in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, Barbara Bell Coleman, who is a descendant of Henry Taylor, who I told you about earlier, came and gave just a really moving, poignant um, keynote on what this building meant to someone whose descendants built it. Um, I can't possibly reproduce what Barbara said that day, but it was just really, she talked about when you see the place that these people worked and lived, it brings it so much more to the fore. Um, and she said it much better than that. 
Her family is in the top right. She actually brought a group uh, of Taylor descendants to tour the site around that time as well. Um, this is an educational opportunity. We, you know, this place matters is in the bottom left-hand corner, which was a national trust, um, a national trust project to promote places like this. Leslie finished her capstone for her master's degree in public history on urban slavery based on this building. And what's next? What do we do with it now? Well, we're going to have, starting in June the 23rd, we're going to have uh, Preservation NCs. We built this exhibit there. Um, this is about Black builders all over the state. Um, black achievement and accomplishment, often in the face of slavery, not always. Just what I've been talking about, how these people took these trades and built North Carolina buildings all over the place. And so that is the crux of this particular, um, we built this exhibit that, that we're doing. Uh, at the moment, it's coming to us on the 23rd in Rosedale, as you can see there. And um, a, a big unveiling of that is on June the 11th, if you're in the Charlotte area. Or well, come and see it with us. These are some of the panels from that, which relate directly to what I've been talking about and what Leslie will talk about. Uh, the various people who built the Bellamy site and their, their stories which are just, as I said before, fascinating. We're also debuting at that moment, um, something else, Leslie, we've been working on, um, which is an exhibit on 1898, which is a history that I hope a lot of you know, but is not for, I'm not gonna talk about it right now. Um, that's, that's another book, but it's an exhibit that we really are pleased to debut here, linking us to what is arguably the most important historical event ever to happen in Wilmington, maybe except the Civil War, but the only coup d'etat in American history, and it runs right through our site. So we're going to debut that at the same time as we built this arise. And this is Leslie's uh, talk. Uh, in two weeks, you'll join her and hear more about the people who built it, more about the people who lived there, more about life in urban slavery versus, say, or juxtaposed with um, rural slavery and, and who these people were and how their life uh, was in this period. And I think that is it for me. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Gareth. And thank you for plugging the, um, the part two of that presentation on June 14th, which I, I just dropped um, a link to Eventbrite in the chat. Um, so if you're interested in uh, see, watching part two with Leslie, uh, please click that link and go and sign up um, and we'll have you there. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, stay open for some questions. Uh, if anybody has questions, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom and I'll go ahead and ask them to Gareth. But I do have a question from Claire Edwards on Facebook. Um, she was asking if the plaster and lath was directly on top of the brick or was it on um, like a stud wall? It looked kind of like there were some furring strips. How was how is the plaster and lath attached to the, the brick walls? It's interesting because it, it depends where you look. Um, yes, you're right. There's fairing strips on the back as well. Um, usually when you got behind it, you would find either some of those, the strips that go down the wall that you then attach the lath to um, were often gone because of termites once again. Um, some of that came back. Some of it was actually adhered right to the brick and only in certain areas. And that was left as was because it was intact. So there's a bit of both, but you would normally reattach it to strips going down the wall. And when we replaced um, the plaster, that's what was done. Uh, it's a bit more stable, particularly in brick, which is so porous and so crumbly, basically. Okay. Um, and then I'm just curious to know, I mean, I think I already know the answer, but um, how, how common is it to know this much about a building like this, like a, a slave quarter building and know who was involved with um, building it. And I mean, finding the, the signatures in the brick and the fingerprints, how, how common is it to have all of these stories and information? Myrick and Leslie, do you want to talk about that? Because I've talked enough. So anybody else want to give an opinion on that? I, I think it's exceptional in terms of the amount that we know about this building. I mean, to have that many people who were keeping diaries from the get-go is, is extraordinary. And part of, what, part of what takes this building up a huge knot. There are two things that in my brain take this thing up a huge knot. One is the urban aspect of it. 
because um, we urban slavery has been wiped off the, the face of the earth to a large degree. Um, and then the second aspect of it from my standpoint is we, we know exceptional amount about the history of this, of the construction of these, of both buildings. Rosie, you wanna? I was just gonna say, I agree that, that there's a, there, are, there are a few other places um, that ha have uh, found out some information, but that was after certain slave quarters were gone. And so I think about the Levi Jordan plantation in uh, Brazoria, Texas, but that they found out things after it was completely torn down. So to have the structure, to have information, which we're still learning, and um, you'll see in my presentation that, that we don't have a lot of images of a lot of the people involved, but but what we do know is tremendous. Gareth, a quick question that other folks may have is, and, and for both you and Leslie, is where were the men staying? Leslie, you You've done the research. <laughs> well, and I, I get into some of that. Uh, Gareth mentioned hiring out. There was also living out in Wilmington. Uh, Wilmington was kind of unique in that uh, the, the General Assembly might make laws for most of North Carolina and then Wilmington and Fayetteville, oddly enough, would often get out of laws or, or enact sister laws that, that got them around things. And so living out was something that the slave owners in Wilmington were really big about. And with your slave owner's permission, you could have your own home. So some of my research leads me to believe that Guy Nixon, who was the enslaved coachman and butler, may have lived in his own home um, here where I'm sitting in the, the uh, reconstructed carriage house. The original carriage house building might have been uh, that space in the open hayloft area. Um, maybe the configuration of the original slave quarters changed uh, when there were, were men uh, coming over from uh, Bellamy's plantation bringing things over they may have to stay the night so it could have been in the carriage house there could have been reconfiguring uh men downstairs women upstairs so we really don't know and don't necessarily think it was a completely static uh right. living situation we often say that there's at least one man upstairs in the carriage house originally but pro and then probably another one and probably others coming and going and like leslie said seven women in the in the other building but that's at a sort of a fixed point in time that we're thinking at the when it was built but that's going to have changed over time people yeah people are moving around more people coming and going so like that and we, we have a question from karen day who wants to know is the current staircase handrail just like it was in 1859 no um that one there's, there's it's like a ship's ladder sort of thing you sort of pull yourself up and i i added that i added that later on it, it was too like i said the stairs aren't even it's narrow, it's dark, and it's steep. And because we have um, tourists coming in, I, I just needed it. There was never a handrail um, there that we found any evidence of at all originally. They would have just walked up and down the stairs. But um, because of what we use it for now, I did make it out of wood so that it wouldn't look incongruous. But um, yeah, that, that's an addition. Uh, shout out to Karen. She's one of our very dedicated volunteers and interpreters who gives fifth grade tours and tours, and I'm glad to see her on here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so maybe if unless other questions come in, this might be the last one, which will be a nice teaser um, to Leslie's uh, follow-up presentation in two weeks. But Francis wants to know how many enslaved people lived in each quarter or like in each area. A lot of times when people hear that there were somewhere around nine or 10 in the, the slave quarters, again, they sometimes, I think, want to just say, wow, that was, I imagine dozens in each room or something of that nature. And so while there may have been, you know, seven or eight women there, possibly a couple of men here, uh, again, um, it may not have been necessarily cramped, but the, the quarters in the living situation were um, not near as, as, as nice as people again come and see it because they are that what they've seen rural slavery even in movies and things and this just really goes against uh, what they saw but I always try and make sure they know they these buildings were typical from New York to New Orleans when slavery was legal in the city so um, so again maybe one or two women or, and girls in each room um, but to come and experience the building in the middle of August. Yes. So let's Absolutely. take it even another notch. It was there's some slave quarters that are being restored and open to the public in Massachusetts, yeah. New Hampshire now. 
yeah from new york to new orleans is a great line it's, mm -hmm. it's not just in the south um and if you think about it something we do say is that uh adding to that if that building was finished in 1859 there's about another 18 months or so before the big house is finished so people are living staying presumably in the, the quarters there to build the other buildings so Again, it's not a static amount of people or gender in one place. When I'm saying, <clears throat> I'm picking a moment in time for who we know was in that building at one moment and we interpret that. Um, and somebody's asking, by the way, on question and answer, where do you keep your collection of materials from the site, the excavation, the archeological stuff? We have a small collection. It's upstairs in, in the office carriage house. Um, and so that's where we keep it. But the better, not the better, the more intact illustrative items are the ones in that case that I showed you, um, pretty much. And was the privy only for the men, is a question. Leslie, you, you got into that. It was, it was actually typical uh, with, with urban slave quarters to have two privies there, one for the slave owner, uh, may, men, male guests, sons, things like that and then one for all enslaved individuals, men and women. So the, uh, the one for us that is the West Privy uh, would have been where Sarah, Guy, Rosella, all of these individuals went, and, you know, but again, they would have had some sort of system. Uh, there's a key that could lock it and lock it from inside. And um, so that one would have been men and women. Uh, again, John Bellamy, his sons and male guests on the other one and then Bellamy women inside in chamber pots. And we have a question from Ray Ann Weaver wanting to know, did the windows open or were they just for illumination and style? Yeah, they open and um, they're not weighted. They just, they stay open those little catches, those bird's mouth catches I was showing, um, but they do wedge open. You're gonna need, even though there aren't windows on the back of the building because enslaved people were meant to be facing the house and forward and that's the, deliberately made focus, um, you still want air in there. It is, like Leslie said, if you come in August <laughs> and you get the, you get a, an idea of 1860s south, southern temperatures, <laughs> it's not comfortable in there. And that's, and we left it that way. And that's, that's quite deliberate. Well, and I guess the, the final note to say that um, you can actually go and visit it in August. Um, they're open to the public. And as Gareth mentioned, they'll have the We Built This exhibit there um, in the middle of June, uh, June 22nd. So we hope that you will actually visit in Wilmington and check out the exhibit, take the tours, um, do the behind the scenes tours that Gareth was mentioning earlier, where you get to see the privy. Um, <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, the email that you get automatically for signing up and registering for this will include a link to the Bellamy Mansion Museum website, as well as a link to um, Eventbrite to sign up for the next uh, June 14th event that Leslie will be doing. Um, we appreciate all of you attending today and um, we'll hope to see you next time. Thanks for coming. <laughs>